Hello Africa, a very good evening and a warm welcome to yet another informative episode of Bottom Line Africa. My name is Yusuf Ibrahim. Let me now take you straight to our headlines tonight. When you're inside the voting booth, what you vote for is your secret. Even their leader Nkurunziza said yesterday that people will vote what's in their heart. It's a matter of hours before polling stations open in Burundi in a vote to extend President Pierre Nkurunziza's term. We are all working to finalize the writing of this constitution and facilitate one person, one vote. Somali's President Mohamed Faramaju promises to deliver a new constitution before the next general election. At least 200 unresolved murder of persons with albinism and now activists want the strongest penalties for perpetrators. And tonight we'll air a special feature highlighting details from the just concluded climate talks in Bonn, Germany. Good evening once again. The bulletin begins right now. Let me begin with our top story tonight, and uh, it comes from Burundi, where polling centers are due to open in Burundi as the country takes part in a referendum uh, that could extend the tenor of President Pierre Nkurunziza in office for at least a decade. The East Africa's, Afri African nation has been unstable since 2015, when Nkurunziza decided to seek a third term in office that his opponent said was unconstitutional. <laughs> Campaigns for Burundi's May 17th constitutional amendment a referendum come to a close with both the yes and no camps holding their final rallies on Monday amidst rising tension ahead of the vote. <laughs> One of the sections of the law in the controversial referendum vote to be amended is on the presidential term limits that could see Pierre Nkurunzinza's rule extended for at least a decade. Human rights groups say they do not think the vote will take place in a free and fair climate where there have been sporadic incidents of violence and abductions. At a recent rally in the capital, Bujumbura, Nkurunziza assured his supporters that the vote will be free and fair. You should listen to those who will tell you to vote yes. And if there are those who will tell you to vote no, listen to them as well. Only you know what's in your heart. Burundi has been gripped by political crisis since April of that year when Kurunzinzas announced that he would stand for a third term which the opposition said violated the constitution as well as a 2005 peace deal that ended a civil war. He won a vote largely boycotted by the opposition, but protests sparked a government crackdown that has killed more than 700 people, displaced over 400,000 to neighboring countries, and left the economy moribund. Opposition leader and deputy speaker in parliament, Agathon Rwasa, campaigning for a no vote, urged his supporters to come out in their numbers. <laughs> When you're inside the voting booth, what you vote for is your secret. Even their leader Nkurunziza said yesterday that people will vote what's in their heart. The referendum will decide whether to amend the constitution to extend presidential terms to seven years from five. The proposed changes would limit the president to two consecutive terms, but would not take into account previous terms, potentially extending Nkurunziza's rule to 2034. Critics say this is a likely step toward Nkurunzinza seeking a life presidency. Diogomba is the regional coordinator for Eastern Africa at ENACT, a project under the Institute for Security Studies. The first thing that the government, this government has been looking for in Burundi is legitimacy. And that is what is behind the whole uh, problem, uh, the whole political crisis, is because the government is not legitimate. So the referendum is going to give it constitutional and legal legitimacy that it is looking for. More than 5 million Burundians are expected to vote on May 17th. As an ordinary citizen, even though we did not get the sufficient time to learn about this referendum, we will still vote and show what's in our hearts, even if my vote may not change anything. 
we will still vote. I will vote for what works for the country. I will not vote for something that will divide the country. Critics warned that the country's political crisis could deepen with a repressive act such as the suspension of all operations by the British Broadcasting Corporation and Voice of America last week. On May 11, at least 26 people were killed in northwestern province of Sibutoke. Seven others were wounded. Burundian authorities described the attackers as terrorists coming from and returning to Congo. Some residents of Sitiboke who did not wish to be named said it was likely the attack was to warn anyone against voting in favor of constitutional changes. Burundi has reached uh, a, tiki, a, a tipping point with that referendum and after that referendum uh, we are likely to see uh, more uh, opposition on the ground. We are likely to see more killings by the government uh, and uh, that will just push the country further to the precipice. UN rights investigators and independent activists have accused government forces of widespread violations, including forced disappearance and orchestrating a campaign of terror. Regional efforts to find a peaceful resolution to the conflict have dragged on without results. Fatiha Mohammed Noor, KTN News. Over to Somalia, where President Mohamed Abdullahi Farmajo has promised to ensure Somalia holds the next elections under new constitutional order. In his statement, read by the Speaker of the House of the People, Mohamed Mursal Abdirahman, during the end of a three-day national constitutional convention in Mogadishu, the search for a new constitution had taken too long since it was launched in Djibouti in the year 2000. He said the delivery of a new constitution was one of the key promises that led to his election in February 2017. Somalia is governed by a provisional constitution agreed in 2012, and the promulgation of a new and permanent constitution is expected to address a number of unresolved constitutional issues, including the one pass on one vote, the future status of Mogadishu, and the sharing of powers and resources between the federal government and the federal member states. We are all working to finalize the writing of this constitution and facilitate one person, one vote. I'm one of the oldest people here, but I'm embarrassed that I've never had the privilege to vote. As a citizen of Somalia, I want to get an opportunity to say that I voted. The National Convention is calling for the following principles to be the basis for the review process. Ownership of the process should be Somali-led and Somali-owned. The review process should be finalized by December 29, 2019. See today as a great day for the review of the Constitution. It should be inclusive and agreed on through consensus and bring an end to the provisional Constitution so that we can be respected internationally. It's out really busy. Nobody can come here. Because I'm, I'm some, they did you know good job here in Somalia. Uh, really, they did you know uh, their activity to bring in Somalia peace and stability. That's really even those you know conference was held you know out of Somalia. But today we are very happy. This you know a constitutional reform, and this all the Somali they gathering here more than you know 1,000. Really, it is you know. Uh, uh, good chance to the Somali people. Now, at least 100 people have been uh, kidnapped along a road in northern Nigeria in the past few days, raising concerns over insecurity in parts of the country. Being in Gwari, in the northern uh, state of Kaduna, is known for its lawless, lawlessness and thick forest that provide bandits with hideouts from security forces. Earlier this month, at least 45 people died in an attack on a village in the region. Kidnapping is very common in the region. In 2014, the abduction of more than 270 schoolgirls from the town of Chibok shot the Boko Haram Islamist insurgency into the spotlight. President Mohamedou Buhari has been criticized for not fulfilling his promises, especially on security matters. Now, a delegation of the Intergovernmental Authority on Development that is eager, a Council of Ministers met and held consultations with the leader of Sudan's People's Liberation Movement, Riyak Mashar, in Pretoria, that is in South Africa, where he has been under house arrest for nearly two years now. 
According to a statement from IGAD indicated, the three-hour meeting deliberated on progress of the South Sudan peace process and was meant to get his side of the story concerning the resume talks and a program known as the High-Level Revitalization Forum. The meeting with Mashar is the first public encounter by IGAD officials. The bloc in April said they will accept Mashar's release as long as he renounces violence, stays away from South Sudan and does not directly take part in talks. His side, however, disagreed with this condition, saying the peace talks required everyone on board. <laughs> Over to some development in DRC, the World Health Organization has sent the first 4,000 doses of an Ebola vaccine to the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Officials hope the vaccine can contain the latest outbreak, which is believed to have killed at least 20 people since April. The experimental vaccine was shown to be uh, effective during limited trials in West Africa during the 2014-2016 Ebola outbreak, which killed more than 11,000 people. We, we have agreement, registration, plus uh, import permit, everything formally agreed already. And as you know, that vaccine is um, safe and efficacious and has been already tested. And so um, uh, I think we can, it's, it's uh, all is being prepared. All is ready now to really use it. Jenny. Sir, sir. So I have to arrive, we have to start, and then uh, hopefully by the end of uh, this week, that's what we are aiming. If we have difficulties by Monday, we should start. Sir. A week from today. Associated with Ebola, there is stigma. And we have to go and show that uh, that should really stop. And if there is risk, my life is not better than anyone. Millions are there already, and we have to really show that. Now, a new report says the number of Africans taking refuge within their countries because of conflict has doubled in a single year. The report by the Norwegian Refugee Council, that is NRC, and the Internal Displacement Monitoring Unit found that nearly 3 million people were left homeless within their countries in 2017, bringing the total to nearly 6 million. It says the hardest hit country was the Democratic Republic of Congo, while South Sudan, Ethiopia, Nigeria, Somalia and the Central African Republic were also affected. The report says many of them live in insecure areas, making it all the more difficult to provide them with essentials like food, water and medicine. There have been 22 unresolved murders of people with albinism in the last four years in Malawi, sparking calls for killers to be executed to deter attacks. Malawi is one of the most dangerous countries in the world for people with albinism. A lack of pigmentation in the skin, hair and eyes were targeted so that their body parts can be used in magic portions and other ritual practices. About 1 in 20,000 people worldwide have the congenital disorder with higher rates in sub-Saharan Africa. Attacks against people with albinism have occurred elsewhere in southern and eastern Africa, including in Mozambique, South Africa, Tanzania, as well as Burundi. Association of People with Albinism in Malawi have been holding meetings in various districts of the country so that people with albinism can you know, engage with authorities on how the killings can be stopped. The latest murder of a man with albinism has sparked calls for their killers to be executed. The corpse was found buried in southern Malawi several weeks after he was last seen. Several body parts were missing. Initially, it was like it's a thing that is more in the villages, but now it's been coming into the urban setup where some of us live, and that is bringing a lot of fear. Like in my case, I could not go out beyond 6 p.m. It's something that our, my family worry as to where I am. So government could have learned from other areas because Malawi is not unique. People who are suspect in the cases of, of persons who have been, whether they'll be given life imprisonment, whether they'll be given a death penalty, I think that will not really matter to us. What we are focusing on is access to justice. We, while we're speaking now, we're talking about the 22 murder cases, none of them has gone to court. If much of them are advocating for death, then so be it. But as of now, I cannot outright say it that uh, death penalty is the right approach. No. 
Now, Guatemala has integrated its Israel embassy in Jerusalem today, becoming the first country to follow in the footsteps of the United States, States deeply controversial move. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and Guatemalan President Jimmy Morales were among officials attending an integration ceremony at the new embassy at an office park in the city at the heart of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Netanyahu praised the Central American nation for making the move and noted it came only two days after the United States opened its embassy in Jerusalem. The U.S. embassy move on Monday was accompanied by mass protests and clashes along the Gaza border that saw Israeli forces kill 60 Palestinians and injured more than 2,000 others. Now, various countries have reacted to the U.S. Embassy move in Jerusalem, and here's some of their views. Take a look. The loss of life we have seen is tragic and extremely concerning. Such violence is destructive to peace efforts, and we call on all sides to show restraint. There is an urgent need to establish the facts of what happened yesterday through an independent and transparent investigation, including why such a volume of live fire was used and what role Hamas played in events. Palestinians have the right to protest, but these protests must be peaceful. We are concerned that extremist elements are seeking to hijack legitimate protests to further their own objectives. And while we do not question the right of Israel to defend its borders, the use of live fire and the resulting loss of life is deeply troubling. We urge Israel to show restraint. Then what happened, and uh, there will be a reaction uh, from our side, and we will see what the council will do. You know, today actually we will. Today or tomorrow, we might ask for emergency meeting. But we have to. We are in, still in consultation with other uh, Arab group and the Palestinian ambassador on this. Who's to blame for what's happened? For you know the the occupying power, Israel. Okay, thank you. Now, North Korea has threatened to cancel the forthcoming summit between leader Kim Jong-un and U.S. President Donald Trump if Washington presses ahead with its key demand for Pyongyang to unilaterally give up its nuclear arsenal. According to local news station, Vice Foreign Minister Kim Kye-gwan said if the Trump administration quote-unquote corners us and unilaterally demands we, go, we give up nuclear weapons, we will no longer have an interest in talks and will have to reconsider whether we will accept the upcoming uh, DPRK. U.S. summit. The North Korean has suspended uh, talks with the South Korea over the Mark, Max Thunder joint military exercises between U.S. and South Korean forces. The highly anticipated meeting between U.S. President Trump and North Korea's Kim Jong-un is due to take place on 12th June. Now, U.S. franchise Pizza Hut is the first major international restaurant to open an outlet in Ethiopia. Despite a deeply traditional food culture, Ethiopians have taken to the entry of the new fast food option, but some remain cautious not to get swallowed up by it. Take a look. It has been about a month since Pizza Hut officially opened in Ethiopia. At one of the three outlets in the capital Addis Ababa, weekends are busy with families streaming in to try the new brand. The U.S. fast food chain is the first major international restaurant franchise to open in Ethiopia. Pizza Hut already has 188 branches across Africa and plans to expand even further on the continent. In Ethiopia, Michael Gebru, CEO of Belayab, says their investment has created up to 100 jobs and the hope is to grow their staff to 250 in the next two years as they open more outlets. People is great, it's fantastic. I mean, uh, let's also not forget that in Ethiopia we have uh, over 350,000 experts, a huge diplomatic commission. Um, a, a diplomatic mission which are um, from abroad and I have brand awareness so they were very happy but I, ha I must I must admit most of our customers are Ethiopians and I'm proud of that. Anger over high unemployment fueled violence over ethnic tensions that led to the resignation of the former Prime Minister Haile Mariam Dissalane in February. His successor Abi Ahmed has promised a new political beginning although he has not outlined plans to loosen the state's grip on the economy. Ethiopians love Anjera, and it is served at all meals as a symbol of national pride and cultural heritage. 
Few foreign dishes have been able to take away from it. it comes to injera, I can eat it seven days in a week. In fact, I can eat it for breakfast, for lunch, for dinner. Pizza Hut is obviously not that kind of food. Rather, it is another alternative that we can try out once in a while, once in a week or so. Pizza is not new to Ethiopia. Many restaurants serve a variety of cuisine, although most of them are locally owned. A Foy Pizza is a popular restaurant for Addis Ababa's young middle class, opened 10 years ago. Western retailers are increasingly targeting Africa, which is home to rising consumer spending and some of the world's fastest growing economies. Ethiopia, Africa's second most populous nation, holds massive potential. The government has already let foreign companies such as fashion chain H&M set up factories in a decade-long push to change economic focus from agriculture exports such as coffee to manufacturing. Well, and th from that report, uh, in the second most populous country in Africa, that is Ethiopia. Now over to some uh, development here in Kenya. And of course, Muslims in Kenya and across the world are set to begin the holy month of Ramadan starting tonight. Of course, that is, uh, it's one of the pillar of Islam. And let's take a look at some of the, uh, you know, images, sounds and sights of this uh, holy month. We now take a short break, but when we return here on Bottom Line Africa, we'll be running a feature by our Foreign Affairs Editor Lilian Odera with the highlights from the just concluded technical climate change negotiations in Bonn, Germany. Stay with us, but first, uh, here is Destination Africa. This is KTN News.